jet Don't just be It is the most profoundly extraordinary generation alive. It outnumbers all others, owns most of the housing stock, and spends more money on fresh fish, wine, and mini-breaks than any other demographic group. Now, I may only be an actor with a very, very limited brain, but it doesn't make a lot of sense to me that our media bosses remain so besotted with the under-30s, who, so far as I can see, exist in a state of grinding poverty, fair dodging on public transport and stealing from news agents, poor wretches, but I'm not here to do the government's bloody job for it. I am, as I say, a performer. And I want, in this masterclass, to celebrate what I believe will be regarded as the belle époque of third age acting. Oof! The public's appetite for watching older actors on their screens is as rapacious as ever. And when you think about it, why should it be otherwise? I'm just as capable of exploding on set as I was 30 years ago, or advertising mints, or dressing up as a 1980s policeman. Let's look at some of the other things that older actors are perfectly capable of doing. Can't beat a bit of trance when the creative juices won't flow. Dirty little sod you are. How about a spot at Nom Nom? <whistles> Never before have the over 60s been so active. Their canal boats throng the waterways, Cumbria shudders to the tread of their hawkshead footwear, and their fleeces polish the statuary of our great country houses as they head for an early lunch in the stables restaurant. But while the retirees are enjoying their soups and salads, senior actors are working harder than ever. <laughs> Ralph! <laughs> It's interesting to compare the skill sets of older actors with their younger colleagues, who are usually required to do not much more than look vaguely decorative in hospital corridors. When youngsters come to me for tuition, I'm often left breathless by their lack of technique. It's not remotely their fault they've been raised on inferior soap scripts instead of weekly rep, but I wouldn't entrust them with a classic older role. They simply don't have the lung power. Well, don't say later I didn't warn you. <laughs> I mean, when I'm... <laughs> when I'm dead, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mm. 
You need a larynx like leather to tackle a 12-part classic bronchial condition like that. So I think we're seeing that playing old is no cushy retirement hobby, whether you do it in a sports jacket, a bald wig or a frock coat. When I did Ebenezer Tumble Whiskers, it took three months to perfect the wheeze alone, which of course worked out very nicely, and won me the Benelin Award, which was smashing. And no, I'm emphatically not going to attempt to reproduce it for you now. I want to have some voice left for come dine with me tomorrow. But I will, I will do the toothache noise. Oh! Try keeping that up for a four-month shoot, curry pie, and you won't be singing Send in the Clowns at the rap party. Bit toppy, that one, actually. But the second most important vocal challenge for the actor in a character role is the accent. May ye rot you, and rot ye will, I and your twisted little son. The elder accent, sometimes called Oldshire, is hard to master, as it isn't geographically specific. For tumble whiskers, I incorporated elements of Northern, Cornish and Cockney, while keeping the tremulous vibrato going, of course. Now, you might say that if you're already quite old in the first place, you don't really need to do an Oldshire accent. But I think that's A, lazy, and B, shortchanging the audience. Tempret, come and hear this time of night, but his ear just the same. What are you talking about? Yes, I alone must judge. And they never brain out but lies. What did thou shoot this then up for? All on us feel the loss of her now she's at school. Well, cheer up, my lad. But I feel it more than anybody else. I'm a lone, lone creature, and she's almost the only thing that doesn't go contrary with me. Jack Jones has had enough. He will fight an enemy on his two feet. But he will not. Oh. The walk there, merging effortlessly with accent, stick, and dodder. As it should. The use of props to enhance your characterization is a bit of a thorny issue, especially if you're completely cack-handed like me. So I'm not really a pipe-and-stick man. But if you can do it, then for heaven's sake, let's see the goods in the window. Oh. You are soft. Thank you. Well, it's difficult to know what's right. Good, Andrew. Turning this place into a factory. Drag him away! Take him out of my reach! And not be popped off with any more of your hands. Uh. If the accent provides the meat of an older characterization, the walk is the butcher's boy, pounding the cobbled streets and delivering the goods to the customers. Walking has always been an extravagant passion of mine. I probably walk more than anyone else I've ever met. And I often use my walks to try out different character gates. I got tumble whiskers on Offer's Dyke, for example. This is a little book I wrote in 97 called Charming Walks for Older Actors. There are dozens of different walks in here, of varying degrees of difficulty. And you can use them to try out anything from a little sciatic twinge to a full-blown Douglas Barder. Oh, there's a lovely little shamble that Martin Clunes used in Mr Chips. Actor mates have said some ludicrously complimentary things about this, and I'm, I'm not unproud of it. But I think that for any actor, the greatest fun of all is to make up your own shuffles and totters. And remember... You're never too old to do a decrepit walk. There'll be a raider come all the way from Dr. Innocent. It'll cost 300 million. Hiding out of sight and letting folks think that was a cripple and a half-wit. Standards of limping have improved immeasurably recently. It may be because of charming walks, not for me to say. But older actors are setting new records for mobility and moving at speeds hitherto undreamed of. Critics might carp about the proverbial old man in a hurry, but I don't hear the audience complaining. Come then, we must run.
Box Since BAFTA created the three mobility categories, hobble, stoop and stagger, the competition's fiercer than ever. I mean, people make fun of all these different acting awards, but they are statements by the public or your peers, and in this case, Booper, saying, yes, we accept you. Yes, we love you very much. Your tumble whiskers touched us in a very special place. And something else I can't quite read, actually. But when you see the sheer range of skills displayed by older actors, you wonder why they bother handing out baubles to sound designers and Canberra Watts' faces. They're only doing what they do anyway, after all. It's all somewhat baffling. Confusion, you see. There's another thing older actors do sublimely well. Why did I write, I wonder? There was something in my mind, I know, but when I talk for long, I get confused. Do you remember the name of your street? Are these Garibaldi's? What number bus would you take to get home? Bus. Seems to be trying to say something. There is, of course, a finite element to playing an older part. You're not often lucky enough to come back in a later episode as your long-lost twin, as I did in Doctors in 2004 and in 2005 and again as the old sea dog who'd lost his mind last year. But I think the chief problem in playing an older role is that the process of acting is in itself rejuvenating. For many, just getting a call from your agent can take years off. I've seen it happen to Alan Rickman in Selfridges Food Hall when he got the low-fat flora voice test. So the actor has to stay totally focused on the oldness of the character. Walk, wheeze, dribble, babble and tremor, and if you don't pay attention to those details, it can all go very wrong indeed as it does here. When you step into a bathe-easy walk-in bath, you're stepping into a world of luxury and comfort. No more worries of slipping or falling. It's so easy to use. I mean, yes. Obviously, one always wants to appear one's best. But if you turn up on set looking like something out of the juvenile section in Spotlight, then you're simply not doing your job. Spotlight. It's the casting director's Bible. Producers swear by it. And it's also marvellous for out-of-work actors who've nothing to do with their day but, um, but look through it saying, oh, blimey, that was taken a while ago. An activity to which I'm hopelessly addicted. Spotlight. Bloody hell. Just seen a picture of Michael Kitchen in a Solidarity T-shirt. Spotty is divided into sections. There's young, which is where you'll find all the middle-aged actors. Then there's the leading section for older actors and character for very old, ugly actors. There's also an appendix of quarter-page photos at the back of the book for exceptionally old, ugly, poor actors, many of whom don't have agents, but who do run laundrettes and car hire firms in the East End. It's absolutely indispensable, not just if you want a cab back home from town late at night, but if you're a casting director looking for something specific, like, say, a dirty old man. Madeline, my love, your hand here. This lady will condescend. Just a deep of her fingers. Come, Ride. It's been a pleasure looking at you, my dear. But I suspect you're well aware of that. Hello, cowboy. I have three sacks of ladies here in my shop, but none so beautiful as me. That's enough, my friend. You can admire her as the rest of us do without taking that liberty. Young woman. Oh, my, oh, my daughter. <laughs> Brilliant. Oh, first class. Yes, thank you, John. All your specialist silver skills, like still having sex, mowing the lawn, eating roll mops, getting the carrots on early, all the little flourishes you'd expect to see in a prestige drama or commercial will be listed in here. So a casting director will be able in seconds to find someone who can do... Well, let's think of a different example. A dirty old woman. Is there anything else that's worrying you? I get this fluttering sometimes. Yes. 
Sometimes my heart skips a beat. Is there any pattern as to when these incidents occur? Oh, yes. It's whenever I'm near you. This actor has obviously listed dealing with an improbable script as a specialist skill, so the director knows she'll be able to cope with anything as well as being dirty as all get out. Thank you for the card and the cake. It was very, very sweet of you. Now, is there anything more I can do for you? Just remember to think of me every time you take a mouthful. Yes, it's... No, I don't think there's much else you could do with that line. As long as the producers are happy, then I always tell myself, go home, pour yourself a gin, and book a little Eurostar jolly to Bruges as a reward. So, let's look at some more from the dirty old women section. Starting with... Sean Phillips. Would you do as much for me? I am, after all, Caesar's wife. Mr. Pallas's political interests need not disturb you, my dear. Quite the reverse. They will keep him out of the house, so to speak. So you will have plenty of leisure for your own chosen pastimes. Poetry and, uh, that kind of a thing. Cool. Look at him. I love big man, don't you? I love him. See this knot in my stocking, darling? Would you like to tighten it for me? <laughs> Quite a stud, aren't you? A right dirty dozen there, and a good deal more going on than might be evident at first glance. If we can just get the three pretty dirty things back on the sofa for a sec. A world-class lecce lineup with Fabia Drake out there on the right of frame, Sonia Dresdel closest to us, and Susan Hampshire in the middle. My dear. Quite the reverse. And we can see how the actor on the right performs what's known as the dirty stick, driving home the filthy analogy, finishing with a nice turn and leer. In fact, if we just rewind that and look again... But Mr. Pallas's political interests need not... We can see the understanding between the actresses as the innuendo goes from Drake... They will keep him out of the house. ...to Dresdel. So you will have plenty of leisure for your own chosen pastimes. Poetry. Dresdel passes Hampshire. Back to Drake. Oh, yes! Mr. Palliser is a very gentle, very... Innocent man. We're rapidly coming to the point where unless we see some more dirty old women back on the telly sharpish, then Joanna Lumley is really going to have to throw an egg at someone. So what we're getting on television just now is perhaps not a great deal of change in the perception of older women's sexual appetites, which is a shame, but not disastrous, because we can still see mature ladies making utter fools of themselves over their pets. Come up from your darkness, my little mopsy man. <laughs> Don't be afraid of him, my little wounded soldier. One for mummy and one for Tricky. There you are, my darling. Good boy. We shall all have a judgment on the day of judgment. Plunder precedent, jargon, gammon and spinach. And then you shall sing to your heart's content, my little ones. It's very important that if an actress is given a pet, she goes completely mental over it, because there may not be much else to get your dentures into. But this is uh, the Turkish van cat. And Bugger off, blessed. Cat. Wrong category. Anyone else got a cat? Thank you. This is Arthur. He's not moving. You must do something. You've called me here for a cat. Hmm. If you haven't got a stuffed cat to go potty over, then just use whatever comes to hand and follow your instincts. Ailsa. Boys don't make passes at girls in glasses. <laughs> You're right, young gentleman, I am mad. Mad because of this place. I won't eat processed food. Dad, could you pass the potatoes, please? He's not your dad. We never knew who your dad was. Good put. Yeah. Come on, mother. 
I've always been extremely good at finding things to get hysterical over, like when Tumblewhiskers lost his inheritance, or in Doctors when they tried to take away the old sea dog's jigsaw puzzle. And to be brutally honest, I do get a bit tired when actresses go all poor me and grumble about lack of parts. It achieves nothing, and it's a very good way to end up miserable as well as invisible. Anyway, it's a complete fallacy to say that there are no interesting parts for women over 35 when there are so many splendid battle axes to be played. You ought to know I am not to be trifled with. Get back! Very odd. You're not really trying to outwit an old woman, are you? You're trying to be funny. My way with invalids, Mr. Farnan, is to give them nothing that might excite their blood. Now remember, if anybody talks, I shall have something to say. It's not a bad idea to distance yourself from your battle axe by doing an indomitable voice or battle accent and wearing an enormous hat. It minimises the risk of anyone thinking you're really like that. But however you choose to walk and speak, if you're playing a battle axe, you need plenty of horsepower under the bonnet. I will not be interrupted. Do you think I don't know what a woeful day it was when you first came her way? When you do become engaged to someone, I or your father, should his health permit him, will inform you of the fact. Tell me once and for all, are you engaged to him? How exquisitely polite. Overpowering, really. Do you know who I am? George. Oh, fiddle-faddle, George. But who's your mother? Who are your uncles and aunts? I won't have donkeys on my green! I don't really have a great deal of patience with actresses who moan about a dearth of parts. I'm not going to grumble, but how many men get to play battle axes? League of Gentlemen? David Walliams? That's about it. I mean, Matt Lucas, obviously. Michael Ball. You know, not many. Douglas Hodge, Terence Stamp, Graham Norton in the cast of Carjo Falls, and Priscilla, Queen of the Desert. It's a tiny tiny handful of mature men who get to put on a frock and a bonnet and play an assertive older woman, Ian McKellen. So, yes, there are some, but it's hardly as though there's an abundance of battle axe roles for older men. Instead, us chaps have to clamber into the old cross-patch drag. At least ready to the dogs. What else can I be when I live in such a world of fools as this? Merry Christmas. I will have nothing to do with any child. Go on, off it, and keep your thieving hands out of them lockers. I'm out of here. Good man. Ah, I get stuffed. Hey, oh, go on, Alan! We're late. Spend all day wrestling for breath in your bloody late. None as anyone can find, and none as is anyone's business. Now, don't you be a meddlesome wench, hawking the nose where it's no cause to go. Oh, I don't know what some people are coming to these days. I may be old, but I still know what's what. You can be curmudgeonly in any century and anywhere on the social ladder, but for the delivery of ill temper in its most concentrated, choleric form, there's no better character than the sourpuss servant or affronted butler. So, here's the frock then. Tail coat. You can go threadbare like this, or add some braid for extra pomposity as desired. Slightly pinched trousering. Why? To accentuate the bow-leggedy walk. Bald wig, with stray hairs optional, and absolutely pivotal to the success or otherwise of your perf. These guys. They may not look much, but my two bushy buddies here can chill a drawing room atmosphere like a bucket of ice. And if truth be told, I'm only 75% alive when I'm not wearing a pair of these. This is a handy bit of kit, too. You can look contemptuously at the contents, thus. And more importantly, jot down some of the trickier names you might have to announce. Those Russian ones can be absolute buggers. There's nothing worse than trudging all the way down here from the double doors, only to find the bloody stupid names flown out of your head. So safety first is my motto. But, for dispensing misanthropy to the max, these are the artillery. So let's open up the spirit gum and see where do they take us. My lady, the Marchioness of Hartletop is here. Mr. Soames, sir. An urgent message from the Prime Minister, my lord. Madam is waiting, Alexei Ivanovich. She sent me to find you. Lady Glenmire rang the bell, and I... I believe it was for tea. Don't bring me on my pears in future. Hey, no, no, no. I was about to bring it, ma'am. 
The grumpy butler is actually one of the more rewarding third age parts. You may not have a great deal to say, but that means less to learn, and anyway, you've got your little metal mate. Moreover, you're unlikely to die in childbirth or in a duel, and there's a fair chance you'll survive to the end of the series. Not a lot of dialogue, as I say, so the challenge is to get the most out of every word that's there, even if you've only got a yes or a no. Here are some of the profession's finest one-word wonders. Bring me that cigarette case Mr. Worthing left in the smoking room the last time he dined here. Yes. Yes, miss. No one? Yes. Yes. Miss. Very good, my dear. Yes. Yes. A glass of sherry, Lane? Yes, sir. Tomorrow, Lane, I'm going bunburying. Yes, sir. I shall probably not be back till Monday. You can put up my dress clothes, my smoking jacket, and all the bunbury suits. Yes. It's so much better if you can, as we say, do it with a look. There are 110,000 muscles in the human face. I have quite a few more, actually. So I'm very lucky I can just open up my butler's pantry of disapproving looks and see what's there. Crotchety scowl, perhaps, with a little bit of tutting thing going on, maybe a twitch or tremor. And if there happen to be any high-spirited young ladies and gentlemen in the morning room, then I'm afraid I can't resist bringing the house down with one of these. Yeah, <laughs> don't always nail that one. OK. <sighs> oh, I meant to do you a stingy tip tart. Oh, well, I'll have to wait. Too late now. OK, it might appear that I'm now out of character, but that would be a very dangerous assumption to make. Many of my emotional detonators are still active. I don't know which ones exactly, but if I walked out of the studio now, I'd probably carry on opening doors for strangers, take their hats and coats, serve them muffins and make a complete tit of myself. So I have a routine for getting back to me. It used to take an hour, but I've got it down to about 20 seconds. Let's see. You are not a grouchy butler. You are Nicholas Craig. You have one, a Benny and a Booper, and you live in Hampstead and have a little apartment in Gascony. And things are going Really rather well for you at the moment, especially, as I say, with the awards. That was 15, actually. I didn't mention the beach hut at Southwell because I didn't want to sound like a dreadful show-off. So, pretty straightforward. Everyone's got a different method, though. Is my handkerchief sticking out of my pocket, Oliver? Eh? Do you think you could take it without my noticing it? <laughs> Well done, well done! Oh, if you go on like this, you'll be a better man than the artful dodger. It took this actor several weeks to come out of character. He was still doing that in Sainsbury's a month later. No, Tom and Charlie, good boy. I have to say, I can never understand actors who say things were better in the old days. Mates do it sometimes when they're having a bit of a whinge about the state of the business. I mean, hello? Do you remember what it was like trying to buy a Perigord truffle in Clapham in the 70s? I mean, you couldn't. You had to go on a bloody sea voyage to Calais and then drive for ten hours on the D90 something with paralytic Frenchmen trying to shunt you into a ditch. Now I virtually get a choice of black truffles, white truffles, porcini even, at the newsagent. And either I am a complete freak of nature, which I suppose we shouldn't entirely rule out since I'm the only person I know with absolutely no ambition whatsoever to go on Strictly Come Dancing. Either I'm abnormal or it's a total myth that things become harder as you get older. I find everything vastly easier. I don't just mean work, which of course, I mean, obviously one gets better. But even simple things like getting a table at the Caprice or making tulips last. Apart from that, I feel exactly the same as when I was 17. Yes, the old statins make the leg a bit jippy at night and it's a cause for wild rejoicing if I get through to the morning without a couple of totters to the loo. But <laughs> I wouldn't want to be 17 again now for anything. The competition that young people have to face would be just too much for this poor bear. It was completely different when I left Rada, because, of course, then everyone on television was ancient. Not just actors. They all looked like refugees from Martin Chuzzlewit. Oh, 
Well, the proof will come when we take the top off, won't it, Mr. Barrett? Eh? Yes. Oh, look at that. Well, Lovely. Oh, yes, it is. Look at that. You know, yes, that is. yolk nice and runny and white set. Just how I like it. So let's have a look at tomorrow's job. Well, <coughs> there we have it. That is the position that we expect around midday tomorrow. Good evening and welcome to Gardener's World. And this time, from the Magnolias. The Hayward Gallery lunacies have been called non-art, but I think they're much worse than that. Well, thanks, sir. Would you turn off, please? Well, that's just about it on the engine, isn't it? Well, um, I want to play around the carburetor a little more, Barry, after the air cleaner's on. The air and, cleaner, uh, yes. the valve cover, and then mm -hmm. the radiator and uh, bonnet, and then with the Ministry of Transport road test, it's all ready for another 40 or 50,000 miles. Well, the engine, certainly, 50,000, yes. That is the end of news and newsreel for tonight. We shall be on the air at the same time tomorrow. Good night. The shocking thing is that it's not that long ago in terms of actual years. I did Xena Skinner melon boats for a dinner party only last weekend, which young people would no doubt find hilarious. The assistant producers on this programme, for example. But that's the striking difference. Young people now pretend they're teenagers till they're 40. Not Lucy and Octavia, our fab assistant producers who I adore, but generally they do. Whereas in those days, even the children tried to be middle-aged. Hello again. Well, this second semi-final, like the first, is a contest of the boys versus the girls. I'm with the boys here at Elstree at the Haberdashers Ask School. You met them before. Come and have a word with them again. The youngest is Ralph Publicover, who's 12. Ralph, um, what do you do as a hobby, apart from schoolwork? Oh, visiting historic and prehistoric buildings and earthworks. And you have a lot of scope for that around here, of course, haven't you? Mm, yes, but there's a bit more time for it in the holidays. You rub brasses, don't you, yes. Alison? Um, uh, which is the best one do you think you've ever rubbed? Um, in North Each Church in the Cotswolds, it's one of a wool merchant. Um, he's got his uh, wool sack and a sheep at his feet. Mm. Mm. Well, it's all gone the other way now, and the young have completely taken over television, which is quite right, and it's refreshing and challenging and all those things, and I'm absolutely in favour of it, even if you do have to explain rather a lot to them sometimes. Octavia thought Percy Thrower was one of the housemates in Big Brother 4. True. But fortunately, there is a point of connection between the very young and the very old on television, and it's been working rather successfully for some years now. It's a generational nexus where January meets December in an astonishing act of creative symbiosis. No. She needs a doctor. I am a doctor. We need to take her so we can treat you, OK? Please, Dr. Simsaber. She needs oxygen. I'll see what I can do. I'm talking about casualty. One of the most popular dramatic forms of recent years. Medical soaps appealed to today's audiences just as Tudor groundlings were enthralled by Shakespeare. Sorry, Octavia. Old writer-type guy who did the script on, like, much ado about zilch. No, I'm being mean. She's about nine. I've slow roasted joints of pork for longer than she's been in the business. But hospital drama presents to the older actor a challenge completely different from that of a period piece. They ask you to provide your own clothes for a start. This is the frock I wore in Doctors. Then there's the money. Which I'd have to do about 15 episodes a week to even feed my cat, which is impossible, <laughs> as I think they only make 12. But perhaps the more obvious distinction, from a viewer's point of view, is that in a period piece, the older performer will be clarted up with makeup and warts and so on, but in casualty, it's the kids who wear the slap. You want to know where she lived, don't you, Mr. Rainbow? Classic. No one's going to tell anyone anything. Hossie. Hossie. Classic. I drink. The Greeks used to throw their old over a cliff or expose them on a mountain top. Now your agent sends you to do a guest episode of a hospital soap, which may or may not be regarded as an improvement. How long you last at the show is, of course, in the lap of the gods. You might be lucky enough to have a slow, lingering demise spread over several episodes, or you could just keel over at the end of the first. Worst case, a complaint so trivial, like earwax, that you're cured and on the chuff-chuff back to town before lunch with only half a day's fee. So it's imperative to make the most of whatever screen time the gods have seen fit to grant you. Some actors have a special gift which casting directors call the owl factor. <sighs> oh. <sighs> oh. <sighs> oh. 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 Oh.
Oh, Grace, are you in pain? I'll be all right. Ah. He's in VF. Come on, Mum. Are you all right? She's fine. Where's the pen? Here. Ah. As far as accent is concerned, obviously, we've moved a million miles away from the old Sher brogue and the battle accent, and we're aiming for something much more disturbing. We want maximum pathos from the scriptwriter's words, which in this scene are cowheel and tripe. <laughs> Again, we don't want to be tied down geographically with our accent, and even more importantly, we must avoid coming across as posh or intellectual. Unless, of course, we want to incur the wrath of Octavia and her democratising cohorts. But I think that's quite right, actually, because in the past there has been a tendency to be a bit patriarchal. So the more populist, the better, as far as I'm concerned. The BBC wants the mass audience on its side not taking to the streets to torch the producers' second homes. Or their parents' second homes, because they don't move out till they're about 45 these days. Which is fair enough, because it's so very hard for them. What are they to do? But I suppose the crucial difference between hospital acting and period performance is that in a hosy soap, the older actors are always sympathetic. I could have lost you, Lizzie. Oh. Nothing's worth that. You can't get rid of me that easy. Take more than a tumble to finish me off. <laughs> Just as one tends to make the most of being ill in real life, the mature performer in a hospital drama has to grab whatever sentiment is going. This shouldn't really be too hard. You don't live with someone for 60 years and not know when they're lying to you? I don't believe in all that time either of us has lied to the other. I've got you back again when I thought I'd lost you forever. That's the important thing. And if you're still struggling for sympathy after all that, then you just have to hope that the writer's given you a decent war record. You tense your body, everything back, chest forward. Then when your parachute opens, you float down to earth like a leaf on the wind. You know, Hal was at Arnhem. In fact, we both were. We only met for the first time at the home after my wife died. Poor Hal. Yeah, he was taken prisoner. I'm sorry, I don't quite follow. Arm him, miss. It's a battle, Arnhem. It's a battle, miss. Yes, yes, of course. Air Parachute Regiment, Second World War. Wow. We'd served together in the same regiment, you see. Helped each other out of some difficult scrapes, I can tell you. Charlie saved Walter's life. Carried him to safety after he was shot by guerrillas in Malaya. So an old hospital character has ten times the sympathy of a period character, and usually a better war. But less of an accent and no makeup. And you can also forget about having a car to pick you up and take you home. But it is an extraordinary successful phenomenon. When I did my doctors, I mean, people wept. The scene where my sea dog went bonkers and thought he was trapped in a submarine. My cleaner howled. Oh, Mr. Craig, Ben will it be finished? The whole bit. But I have to say, it was a profoundly moving moment. It would have been more so if the twit of a boy playing the nurse hadn't whispered his line so one couldn't hear the cues. But, you, you know, they, they all do this now because of The Wire and 24. And, you know, it's fine. I mean, I do it myself. Sometimes realism, great. But you have to hit your consonants and plosives. Otherwise, we might as well all give up and sod off home. You know, I am many things, but I'm not a mumbler. And I did, I, I did have to say something because, well, I mean, it's pretty basic stuff being heard. Anyway, it did the trick, and the director was fine about it, and we were all busy mates again by the end of the day. So, an up ending for me, if not for my sea dog, who got pneumonia and snuffed it. They used to call pneumonia the old man's friend, and it was certainly my best pal for getting me out of that one. Right. On the subject of feckless youth. Children in need, how could you? I'm a child, I'm in need. Dealing with a cheeky boy is one of the core skills the older performer has to master. But always remember, a young tearaway in any drama is only as callous and casually violent as his elderly victim allows. And yet, I've known some actors hit 60 and think, 
Oh, well, it's not much of a part. The kids can break my shop window or put dog poo through my letterbox and I'll just look a bit sad, collect my fee in sympathy and head for the nearest garden centre. Wrong. As a senior actor, you have to earn that disrespect. Let's see how Pat Routledge handled her cheeky boy. What's your name? Mickey Mouse. Don't be cheeky. Where do you live? Oh, ten down in street. Come back here! Be off! Jane, oh, restrain yourself! Oh, be off with you! Oh. Janet, fetch the constable and the justices. I will not have trespassing! Dickensian impertinence has to be dealt with much more decisively. But you can't afford to be soft on cheek in any period. Stop it! Stop it! You little man! Come on, I'm calling the police to you. I know all of you. Where you live? You ain't gonna do nothing, Granddad. Leave me alone. Wouldn't be hiding anything in them uh, shopping bags, would you? No. Let's have a little look, shall we? Oh, you dropped your shopping. Here, Kenny. Excuse me. Come out of there. You can't go in there. Come out of there. Here's an example of a right bloody source indoors. The sweet old lady a little underpowered. I didn't want my kitchen painted, I told you. The boys have to resort to pop music until finally she hits the gas. Please stop him painting! A boy can be as cheeky as two boiled eggs in a stolen hanky, but it's going to have precisely zero impact unless the victim pulls his or her weight as well. Yeah, you got some good gear in here. Antiques, you know what I mean? Might be worth something to collect. Or even that poor Again, a good snap. war record buys you a shed full of sympathy. Hey, don't be greedy, Grandad. Don't touch anything. What else you got in here? Oh, hey, what's this? Holy old flag. Rule Britannia. <laughs> Leave me alone. Have it. Come on. No. Oh, God. Dear. <laughs> coming. You spineless scum! I'll turn your backside for you, do you hear? It's all about working together as a team. I've just been lucky enough to do Obadiah Slime Bucket for the Sunday evening slot on B1. And there was an amazing rapport between myself and the actors playing the malnourished workhouse inmates who turn on me. I mean, we played football in the rehearsal breaks. Ricketts versus smallpox and so on and we really grew together. Yes, I got the sympathy in the scene where they pelted me with stones and excrement, but there's no way I could have done it without them. And, as I said to Adrian Childs on The One Show, their support made the whole process for me literally like, like being borne along on a, on a jewel-encrusted magic carpet. I just, I just love every one of those incredible guys and, Oh, God, I mean, here we go. I knew this would happen. They would half take the piss out of me down White Hart Lane on Saturday. Pre perhaps just have a look at the scene. How very different from the doctor's experience. Notice you could actually hear these boys. Unlike Nurse Mumble, the whispering menace of the acute ward. So, there are plenty of worthwhile challenges for the senior performer, both in the classics and what are coyly referred to as cops and docs, and even more cloyingly known by their makers as continuing drama. Possibly because it's continuing to break records for discourtesy to actors. Ask for a fee for use of costume. Sorry, Mr Craig, in the current climate we have to cut our cloth. Well, not much sign of cloth cutting among the pashmina-clad furies who hold the purse strings around here. And as for current climate, their current climate looks like the bloody Mediterranean, judging from the permatans they swan around in. Nevertheless, it is an immense privilege to be able to do this work, and to make a difference, and to collaborate with young people who want to learn. And I can sort of afford it with the rental flats, and now I host the drama cruises. And if anything, the number of challenges on offer for actors of a certain age increases. Because fortunately, and this is an absolutely awful thing to say, but people do fall by the wayside for whatever reason, and one is well placed to hoover up the butlers and earwax sufferers and victims of elder abuse, terminal or otherwise.
falling, whether it's by the wayside, off your perch, into a coma or under a bus, is another essential third age specialist skill to list in spotlight. When I do the over 60s drama cruises down the Rhine, I start each group off with a strenuous falling masterclass. It produces some extraordinary work and also a very long queue for the first lunch sitting. We've usually all got our red wristbands on and trays at the ready by 11.15. So, the older actor's fall then breaks down into two moves. Stage one and stagger, 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 out of shot. Then, while I get my bum down on the floor, Hanif repositions the camera for the cutaway. So when you're ready, my dear, like that. So it all looked tremendously dangerous and exciting, but I haven't had to do much at all, which is how I like it. So let's look at some examples of the orthodox BBC television drama fall. Boys and girls, when you're ready. Are you OK? Hannah. Hannah, what's happening? Hannah! And all is gas and gaiters. All the wealth I have is hers, if she will but take me for her slave. You all right? Very nice work indeed. No undignified scrambling, good sympathy levels, and the BBC hasn't had to fork out for a hip replacement. But if you do as many of these as I've done over the years, it does take its toll on the knees. And so by far the loveliest Christmas present I ever had was this, Actors Kneeler, which really does take the pain out of keeling over. Lovely David Jason gave it to me. He's spent so much time down on his knees looking at dead bodies that he absolutely swears by his. Ideal for the studio or location or the garden. I've even used mine for presenting songs of praise. And this one's got a little heating element inside, so it'll do you for a night shoot. Now, there have always been annoying bloody show-offs who insist on doing a fall in one shot. Not me. I'd want a stuntman to stir my tea, I'm so hopeless. Craig, complete physical coward. So if truth be told, I'm envious of the daredevils who can do a fall without any support or cutaway. Here's Patience Collier going commando on the lawn. My nephew? Oh, Lord! I'm David Copperfield. <sighs> That's from the late 70s, but she's still the governor as far as I'm concerned. But if we look at it again in slow-mo, we can see Patience was using an antique actor's falling cloth. This one is made of hessian and once belonged to Sarah Bernhardt. Remarkable piece of acting history. But the story doesn't end there, because I'll be giving a demonstration on it with Judy Dench at the Goodwood House Steam Fair. We've been rehearsing like nobody's business all week, and I'll give you the dates if I can find them. Um, oh, these are Judy's. Bit of sparkle, see? So, yes, Bank Holiday Monday. Do come along. Grandchildren go free if you bring your card. End of plug. And these must go back. So for all the talk of higher fitness levels nowadays and the beneficial effects of glucosamine and Pilates, there were some decidedly perilous stunts carried out in the golden age of TV drama before they agreed it was too expensive and diverted the funds to management paintballing weekends instead. So, let's have a look at a couple of wheelchair fights from the 80s that would make a health and safety officer wince. Charge! Get on my dirty finger, eh, hole? Wheels, shopping, everything on fire there. The demands on the older actor have always been immense, but he's possibly under more pressure now than ever before. Be he in Holby, be he on Celebrity Wife Swap, or be he in a vintage car showing us some of the nicest drives of yesteryear. I severely limit my excursions into this world, hence my non-appearance on Strictly, because it's not, it's not really me, and I prefer to concentrate on what I'm really good at. Although I did go to Weymouth in a Morris Minor for Radio 4. Tremendously exciting programme, because, because we called it a quest. 
which, as I say, made it more exciting. But appearing as oneself is horrendously tough. Where to stand, what to say, who to speak to, given there aren't any other actors around. And it is without doubt the hardest part of all to play. Hello. Hello. <laughs> the main concern of uh, theatre managers and producers since the first night of the first show in the first Playhouse has been... Brian Blessed. Hello, Brian. Hello, nice to be here. Nice of you to join us. I was defeated, flummoxed, and beaten, and in fact, dumb-poked. Tremendous sex appeal. I mean, I'm, I'm a very sexy man. I love you. Oh, there you are. Ooh. Well, if you suffer from claustrophobia... You release all the cats. You want to open all the cages and put them in the fields and dirty them all up, filthy them all, you know? <laughs> Thank you. God bless you. Whether you pop up on the interview sofa, behind the quiz desk, or on the shiny floor, it's like... Well, I always say it's like climbing Mount Everest blindfold with a shark on your back. Can there be anything harder? Yes, actually. There's popping up unexpectedly as a surprise guest. And we have Aquarius too, and of course Aquarius, Telesavalis, and someone who's just like him, Dora Bryan. The key to a surprise pop-in is to look a bit surprised yourself and get the hug over as soon as possible. Oh, yeah. oh what a lovely surprise! <laughs> Maybe another one just for luck, then into the natter. Actually, I didn't know you were a Virgo. Yes. When? I told... What do you mean, when? <laughs> I was you never born. told me. Don't forget to keep working the surprise. God, they're dreary. Dora Bryan. Dora Bryan, ladies and gentlemen. Oh, lovely. Final kiss and get off leaving them gagging for more. Job done. I'm afraid I find doing anything with non-actors a waking nightmare. But by talking directly to the camera, as I'm doing now, not too drearily, one hopes, the actor is able to express his vast repository of knowledge and experience and to use his genius for communication, as well as showing how madly in love he is with all sorts of extraordinary things. It's, a, it's an extraordinarily elegant piece of equipment and uh, it's just full of legend and mythology. I think as a child I'd always been madly in love with it. I also am absolutely, absolutely besotted by hats. This is the hat you should wear when you're having lunch with someone and you want no one else to know about it. These bows range from a little bit less than £100 at the very weakest, of which there aren't many, right up to the very top at £170, £180 here. Uh, which a lot of people say can't be drawn, but they can. This is just to create a sensation in Soho. This is a rear entrance tonneau body. You get in you the back. You come in here? Oh, You of come course. in through the back door. It's all very enjoyable. Oh, and I love the handle. This is lovely for anyone who likes a little joke up the back. <sighs> Bullseye. There is an argument that actors have gone too far down this route over the years setting more store by an appearance on Strictly, say, than doing a big Henry at Bristol or a battle axe on Channel 4. And it's true that one's agent does tend to nudge one in that direction. Miriam, best agent in the world, and a very, very sharp tack indeed, told me even if I fell flat on my arse in front of Len Goodman in week one, the advantages would be incalculable. So one does, as an actor, have to be quite tough and resist. And really, I only did the audition to rule myself out and put an end to the whole ghastly business, which it did, beyond a peradventure, after muttering nurse matey bollocks from doctors, the sea dog's nemesis slithered onto the rehearsal room floor and dazzled them with his fancy bloody footwork, if not his vocal power. But you see, even if the older actor resists the temptation of the, quotes incalculable advantages, or escapes, gratefully, as I did, back to the practice of his art, he still has to contend with the age-old TV boss's obsession with youth. The fact is, you're not just up against your own generation, but every other bugger with a makeup box. I see you learn Irish manners. <laughs> we must consider how to treat your achievements. They point their fingers at us, but look at them. Don't they care what is happening to their young women? Why 
shall look beautiful, girl. Beautiful. Like a bride. Our union, Equity, has recently issued all members over 60 with a panic button to press every time they see Martin Clunes playing an old man. But such is the policy of TV executives, and I don't suppose there's anything to be done about it. We must just accept it with the equanimity that is one of the few consolations of age. I say executives, it's actually the boss's children who run things nowadays. Nothing's decided without them. Did you like the nurse from Doctors on Strictly last night, Africa darling? Yes, mummy, he's hot. Right, we'll give him his own show then. What did you think of Nicholas Craig's masterclass? I couldn't understand the references, mummy. It was a bit too literary. Don't worry, darling, I've cancelled it. We're doing another series of My Nude Arse instead. I mean, you think I'm joking, but it's true. I found a memo in the office. Yep. Series two of Love Your Body. See, I wasn't that far off. It's the kind of thing they want. Still, there'll probably be a different one in charge next month. Survival rate of a Lancaster bomber crew in this place. Look it up, Octavia. Well, I hope you've found this browse through mature pastures useful and enjoyable. I certainly have. And I think we've seen that despite one or two problems, things aren't really so bad for older actors. We've got our houses, for one thing. And we've learnt how to survive at a time when everyone else is wailing about their pension pots and boo-hoo, I've lost my job and oh, it's not fair, my flat's been repossessed. Well, we're all freelancers now, sugar plum, so get used to it. It's a recession. I've been freelance for 35 king years. So perhaps there will be a little more respect for older actors in future. Perhaps even a few more of us appearing on television, if not on Strictly Come Mumbling, as I suggested they rename it, strictly by an ear trumpet if you're dancing with the infant phenomenon. I suspect I've lost Octavia and Lucy for good now. And I must also say goodbye to you. So until we meet again, stay active and keep practising those walks and accents, because it's use it or lose it. Ride up to the ceiling, slowly. Cross behind, cross in front, cross behind, and again, stretch higher and higher, slowly, in front and cross behind, cross in front, cross, come on, once more, stretch right up to the ceiling, slowly, See, can you see? Can you see? Cross behind. 